We're going to be in uh, Exodus chapter 20, but I'm going to start in 1 Samuel 15. If you want to kind of turn there and, and get, get an idea of what we're doing here. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God comes through the prophet Samuel, and he tells Samuel to go to the king at that time, uh, the first king of Israel, Saul, and, and give him a mission. And this is a really significant mission because it's about the Amalekites. And the fact is, God is bringing judgment on the Amalekites. See, God is not asking the, his king, Saul, to go there and expand the territory. He's not asking his king to go there and, and increase his wealth. What's going on here is... God is bringing punishment against a people who need to be punishment or need to be punished. And he's using the Israelites to do that. So there's some restrictions here. When Saul carries out this punishment, he's supposed to carry it out on all the Amalekites. He's told to wipe them out. Not only that, this is not one of those campaigns, like I said, where you get wealthy. That's not what this is about. He's supposed to get rid of everything. In other words, no spoil. Don't bring anything back. Don't let any of the people survive. Just do it. That's the odd order given to King Saul. Saul gets his army together. He goes out there. He warns the Kenites uh, and gets them out of the way. Because he doesn't want to bring this judgment on any of the people who don't deserve to be punishment. And folks, by doing that, he's doing good. And then he goes through with the military exercise. He wipes out the people completely the way God told him to. Almost. Almost. Instead of wiping them all out, he takes the king. A guy named Agag. And all that spoil they're supposed to, you know, supposed to get rid of. All that stuff that didn't look so good. You know what he did? He got rid of it. But the stuff that looked really good, he let some of his soldiers take some of that stuff. So they come back and God tells his prophet Samuel what Saul had done. And Samuel gets this right away. He was troubled. In fact, if you read 1 Samuel 15, you'll find that he didn't sleep all that night. He, he spent the night in prayer. This, this might look pretty good to us, folk. He only spared one man. He only spared a few animals, the best ones. We'd think 9.9 .9 out of 10, that's pretty good. Folk, I want to tell you something. There's some things where pretty good's not enough. And that's in the area of obedience. What if you were on the witness stand and you'd say, well, I've only killed, I've only murdered one person. I'm pretty good. What if your wife came to you and she said, you've been stepping out on me. And you said, well, I only committed adultery once that's pretty good look i don't tell, i don't we need to understand the significance of obedience we need to get it god gave him specific directions and he followed them most of the way but he didn't follow them all the way through and the prophet samuel is distressed about this the next morning he goes to meet the king but he can't find the king can't find Saul. Folks, the king gets this, can't be found because he, the king did, he went up to Mount Carmel to set up a, a memorial, not to praise God. No, he went up to Mount Carmel to set up a memorial in his own honor, a memorial to Saul. Think about this. King Saul is setting up a memorial to King Saul. I think the Bible here is giving us some insight into Saul. When he first became king, Saul was a modest young man. He didn't want any of the attention on himself. That was the kind of guy that God could work through. 
Well, what happened to Saul? He went from being a guy wanting none of the attention to being a guy wanting all of the attention. So family, or Samuel finally gets in touch with Saul and he asks him, why didn't you do what God asked you to do? Saul's response is, I did do what God told me to do. I, I don't know if he's trying to justify himself, trying to rationalize things, but, Sa but, but Samuel, in essence, says, he doesn't really, I mean, he could say this, I can't hear you, Saul, because of the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of the cattle in my ears. Those animals that you were supposed to destroy, those were the sheep and the cattle you're supposed to get rid of. And you brought the animals back. A and King Saul is like, Oh, yeah, that. We killed everybody except the king. And we did get rid of all the spoil except a little bit of the spoil that some of the guys brought home because eventually we're going to give that back to God. And Samuel basically says, stop, stop. And then he says some very famous words in 1 Samuel 15. I'm going to try to prove these words to you this morning. These six words. To obey is better than sacrifice. Do you get the significance of that? Do you know what sacrifice was all about? Sacrifice was, was a, is a man crying out to God on many different occasions. Sacrifices were offered. But the basic idea behind the sacrifice is, here you go, God. I hope you're pleased. In many ways, sacrifice is extremely and closely related to worship. You may love God dearly. You may want to worship him dearly. You want to praise him. That's great. But listen to him. To obey is better than sacrifice. God is not saying he doesn't want the sacrifice. God is not saying he doesn't want the worship. What he's saying is don't jump to that. When you haven't done what I told you to do. Listen to a couple of verses from the message. 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. Then Samuel said, do you think all God wants are sacrifices? Empty rituals just for show? He wants you to listen to him. Plain listening is the thing. Not staging a lavish religious production. Not doing what God tells you is far worse than fooling around in the occult. Getting self-important around God is far worse than making deals with your dead ancestors. Because you said no to God's command, he says no to your kingship. God is saying to Saul, in not following through and doing what God is telling you to do, you're like the heathen who don't even worship God. And here's the last thing he says, to obey is better than sacrifice. What you've done is like fooling around in the occult. He said, it's, it, it's the sin of idolatry. An idol, an idol is, is anything that you set up, anything that gets in the way, anything that gets your allegiance that should have gone to God. And why in the world, if I'm preaching from the Ten Commandments, why in the world am I bringing this passage up? Folks, it's because of this. The Bible says and emphasizes, you love me, you want to worship me, you want to be my followers? Then obey me. But I also want you to hear this. To not obey is idolatry. And you know what idolatry is? It's a matter of the heart. There may be a bunch of reasons we tell ourselves why we're not doing what God says. And what God says it boils down to is, I am not the God I ought to be in your lives. It's a matter of the heart. So let's go back to the Ten Commandments. The first four are all about God, putting Him first. The next three are all about the most important relationships in life, family and marriage and human life itself. And the last three are about your heart. And it's not just the stuff, but why you do what you do. Exodus 20, the last Ten Commandments. Six words is all I'm doing today. Don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. So the woman was going to the train station and on the way to the entrance to the train station, 
she saw a man there who was in shambles. He had, he had a crutch underneath one of his arms. The, the leg uh, that was between the good leg and the crutch looked like it was drawn up. And it looked like the guy was in really bad shape. The guy had a container in front of him. And she knows exactly what he wants. And just looking at him kind of pulls on her heartstrings. So she reaches into her purse. She grabs a container that was right there. She pulls a $10 bill out of her purse and she throws it into that little container right there in front of him. But she's thinking to herself, I don't want to just give this guy money. I want to be encouraging to him. So she pauses and she looks him in the eye and she says, cheer up, my friend. Things could be worse. You could be blind. Guy looked at her and said, yeah, I know. I was last week and people weren't really putting much money into the container. She'd been had. Years ago, I preached at Gunyan Christian Church in Cisney, Illinois. So I was driving back from Jasper County on the most of the time on the Dujic blacktop uh, and then get on 50 for a little while and go down 45 towards Sisney. I was coming back one Sunday from preaching in the afternoon and a guy was hitchhiking. Now this was a long time ago. And I, at that time, pitched up, pick up, picked up most hitchhikers. So I picked him up and we got into conversation and I said, what are you doing anyway? And he said, well, I'm just going across the country. I said, are you hitchhiking across the country? Yeah. I said, where do you stay? He said, oh, when I get into town, I always call the churches because they'll usually put me up. And he said, I didn't tell him I was a preacher. And he said, a lot of times they'll even give me money uh, for the next two or three days. Makes me remember years ago, I was driving late at night and listening to KMOX on the radio out of St. Louis. And they were talking about guys and gals on the streets of Chicago making $300 a day asking for help. So let me ask you something. Which commandment are those people violating? Are they stealing? Are they lying? Are they coveting or are they doing all three? Folks, let's go ahead and shout it from the mountaintops. And the best way you shout it from the mountaintops is being the kind of people that God wants you to be. And it's simply spelled this way, O-B-E-Y, obey. So let's look at these last three commands because these commands are not just ways that are going to proclaim the word or, or to the world what kind of God we got. They're also going to get into our heads and into our hearts and challenge us to ask, what kind of people are we? So here it is, Exodus 20, 15. Don't steal. Contribute. In other words, don't take somebody else's stuff because it's not your stuff. Don't take their stuff. Folks, the world encompasses a whole lot more than that, that. That would encompass a whole lot more than you might think. And when I talk about not taking stuff that is not your own and, and taking somebody else's stuff, that assumes that people get to own stuff. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but some people get tripped up over this idea. Are people allowed to own stuff? Is God okay with that? And folks, the answer is Yes. For instance, in Acts chapter 5, uh, in chapters 2 and 3 and 4 in Acts, you might get the impression nobody has anything. They're not keeping their own private ownership. Everybody is bringing their stuff and laying it at the apostles' feet to meet the needs of the needy and take care of everybody else. Everybody is kind of giving up their stuff to help somebody else. So is it this communistic type of living? Folks, it's not. Keep reading. Acts chapter 5 says... There's a couple named Ananias and Sapphira, and they bring a gift to God, and they uh, lay it at the apostles' feet just like everybody else. And what they wanted was not to be generous. They wanted everybody to look at them and pat them on the back and say, my, my, you're good people. You see, they lied and said, we gave it all when they'd just given some. And the problem wasn't the amount of the gift. 
The problem was they lied about the gift to make it look like they were more generous. And in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, the apostle Peter said to them, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. Listen to this. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. After selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do such a thing? You weren't lying to us, but to God. He's saying, Ananias, Sapphira, you didn't have to give this money. Nobody was holding a gun to their head. At that time, it would have been an arrow. Okay? Here's what he says. When it was yours, wasn't it yours? You didn't have to sell it. You could have sold it and kept the money if you wanted to. Don't lie about it. And the point he is making is you get to determine what, you get, what you're going to do with your stuff. See, the Bible does endorse the idea of ownership. So what are we talking about here? Don't steal. When we talk about not taking stuff that belongs to somebody else, do you know what this encompasses? It's not just talking about theft. It's not just talking about robbery. This is also talking about communism and the redistribution of wealth. And it's also talking about entitlement mentality. So what do I mean by that? The idea that some people have a whole lot more than you do. Folks, I want to tell you something. If people have more than you do or than I do, that doesn't mean that their wealth ought to be taken and given to you and me. What other people have is what other people have. And this commandment is not talking about taking what belongs to somebody else. I don't have time to get into a lot of this, but I want to get to the point because I want to get to the heart because this tells us a whole lot about the heart. Ephesians 4.28 says, He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands and that, that he may have something to share with those in need. Paul quotes this very commandment, don't steal. And he says, don't steal. Those of you that used to steal, he says, stop it. Don't steal anymore. He says, here's what you're supposed to do. Work with your own hands. And folks, he's not talking about blue collar versus white collar. He's talking about how whatever, in whatever way you produce, okay? It may be in making decisions. It may be shovel digging, ditches. It's just talking about do something to produce, he says, don't steal any longer, but work with your own hands so that you might have. And here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say so that you might have to meet your own needs. It says work with your own hands so that you might have so that you can share with those in need. And here's the point, folks. Stop stealing so that you can be somebody who actually helps meet other people's needs. Now. All that said, you're thinking, man, Mike, you, you, you're saying one thing and then you say another thing. And I hope I can tie this up for you. Leviticus chapter 5. When it's time for a sacrifice, God requires a lamb or a goat, but it has to be without blemish. And this is specifically talking about being an unclean or a guilt offering. Either bring a lamb or a goat. But, folk, what if you don't have that much money to have a lamb or a goat? What if you don't have a spare lamb? What if you can't afford it? What do you do? I, I love Leviticus 5 because it says that's okay. If you don't have a lamb or a goat, or you can't afford a lamb or a goat, here's what you do. Bring two birds. They can either be young pigeons or doves. And, by the way, in that period of time, those birds were really cheap. The least expensive animal you could buy. So almost everybody could afford a couple of birds. But here's what I love about it at Leviticus 5. If you can't afford the lamb or goat, you can bring two birds. But what if you can't afford the two birds? What if you're really down and out and you just don't have anything left? Then it says, here's what you do. Bring a grain offering. Now, if you're reading this, here's the one thing that you're going to find interesting. If you can't afford the lamb, bring the birds. If you can't afford the birds, bring the grain. And I'm expecting it to say, if I'd never read it before, if you can't afford the grain, but it never says that. I'm looking for third option. You know why it never says that? 
can't afford the grain. Do you know what the welfare system in the Old Testament was? The wel- welfare system in the Old Testament was not people that have a lot of money set aside some of that money and give it to the poor. See, the people who own the land uh, and you harvest the crop, you weren't allowed to harvest the crop right along the pathway and you weren't allowed to harvest the crop in the corners of the field. You had to leave these parts in the field so that the people who did not have, folk, catch this, could have some pride to get up and do some work and go out and get their own grain. So here's the point. If you can't afford the lamb, bring the birds. If you can't afford the birds, bring the grain. If you don't have any grain, get up and go out and get some grain. But what if you're disabled? Folk, I want to tell you something. I keep asking questions, don't I? You know where that's, fa- that's where family comes in? You need to get this. God has always placed a big value on the family. If you're disabled, you depend upon your family. You had somebody in your life who could go out there and bring in some grain because everybody had to contribute. Do you get that? It didn't have to be as big as everybody else. That's not the point. The point is, you're here to give, not to take. See, God wants us to be the kind of people, instead of looking at what other people have and wanting that, He wants us to look at what we have. It might not be a whole lot. It may be just a little bit. But the point is, whatever I've got, I've got to use it to help God's cause, to help do good things. I want to be a contributor here, not somebody who just takes. That's why some parents are just so sharp. Maybe they can, drive, maybe they can drop $500 in the offering plate, but they still expect their kids to give 50 cents out of their allowance. And that 50 cents, folks, is not going to make much of a difference to the cause, but it's going to make a huge difference to the child. It's teaching them to contribute. We're supposed to be contributors. And, folk, I want to get it this way. Contributors don't steal. Commandment number nine, don't lie. Don't lie. I've already talked some of some about this in previous sermons. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. I think most of you get this. You know this. You know you can't have justice without truth. If you were never able to count on a witness telling the truth, how in the world could you make any judgment? If you didn't have truth, how could you do business? How could you have a marketplace? How could you do business with somebody when they said, oh yeah, that's pure gold, and it's not pure gold? Oh yeah, this is nothing but grain. But there's rocks in the bottom of the truck. What if you had a religion, folk, that said it's okay to lie to people who don't believe like you do? How could you sit down at the negotiation table with those kinds of people, by the way, from the Middle East, who teach that you're allowed to lie to people who don't believe what you believe? How in the world could you come to a conclusion and actually believe what they're saying? Do you get this? If you don't have truth, you can't have any kind of relationship. We've already talked about all that, so let me plant one more seed and then we'll go on. The worst person in the world to lie to is yourself. And it happens all the time. It's just another reason why God never asked us to go through this life by ourselves. We really need people who know us well enough and care about us deep enough to say in our ears, that's not true. You're lying to yourself. There's been, uh, in the last year, there's been at least two times where somebody died. And I thought, it will not make one difference in the world, probably to the family, whether or not I go to the visitation or the funeral. I can get by, you know, it's a long drive and all that kind of thing. I don't, I don't have to show up. And then I got to thinking, who am I lying to here? They were important in my life. 
even though their family didn't know it. See, I could get by with it in everybody else's eyes, but I couldn't in my own. You ever been there on something where you, the only person you're really lying to is yourself? And here's what I want to tell you. The worst person in the world to lie to yourself, and it happens all the time. It's just another reason why God never asks us, okay, just go through life by yourself. And one other thought, if you ever find yourself in a situation when you say to yourself, I cannot be truthful here, do yourself a favor and say, put it this way, I just can't trust God with this one. I just can't trust God with this one because that is exactly what you're saying if you decided to lie. If you lie to supposedly protect yourself or folk, if you lie to even protect someone else, what you're really saying is, God, you're just not a big enough God to handle this one. I've got to tell a lie. And no, you don't. Okay, commandment number 10, don't covet. Now, some people say this verse means not just wanting stuff that you shouldn't want, like having abnormal desire, but wanting specifically other people's stuff. It's not wanting a bicycle. It's wanting your bicycle. And they may or, not be, may, or may not be right on that. Uh, that's not the opinion that I hold. What I know for certain is that the rest of the Bible deals with a much broader picture of this. It's not just wanting your stuff. Here it is. It's wanting to be satisfied by stuff. It's interesting when you look at the words used in the New Testament for covet. They are, they are words that have to deal with the physical appetite. And the idea is this. Have you ever been so hungry that they're running and, and they're running the, your favorite meal at the restaurant and you know how that tastes and you're just thinking to yourself, oh, that will be so good. Folks, that's exactly what we say when we say to ourselves, just a few thousand dollars more, just a little bit longer vacation, just a little bit better position. Those things that we lust after, we lust after them because we think it will feel so good or taste so good. And here's the deal. We know that's not true. Follow that lie that we tell ourselves. Just a little bit more money, just a little bit more success, just a little bit more recognition, a little more enjoyment in life. If that's the case, folk, then the wealthiest people, what we would term the most successful people in the world, maybe the top-notch athletes in the world, or the highest-paid actors in the world, or the, the wealthy musicians in the world, they would be the happiest, wouldn't they? They would be the most mentally secure people on the planet. Folks, I, I would submit to you, they're some of the most messed up people on the planet. You look at the world's wealthiest people, and look at what wealth has done. We know they're not the happiest people on the planet. Here's the problem. It's kind of like the person that knows, I need the surgery to get the tumor taken care of, but I'm putting it off. Because why? I'm going to take one more pain pill to get through this day. See, the problem is that we don't realize that isn't going to satisfy us is. The problem is, okay, I know money's not the answer, but uh, I'd like this $5,000 more. Just a little bit more. It's like taking another pain pill. And you know what? There may be temporary pleasures associated with some of those things, but don't let that sidetrack you. Ultimate fulfillment. Ultimate fulfillment comes only in God. I want us to go to Philippians 4 into a passage that I believe is probably the most, the, the passage that is most taken con, out of context in the whole Bible. Philippians 4. Listen to this. Start, I'm, I'm going to go to verse 13 and 11 and 13 and all that. But I want to start at verse 10. Paul says, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned to be content with whatever I had. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. The, the Apostle Paul, get this, is saying, I've had those times when I've been raking it in. There have been times when I've lived really well. And you know what? I was satisfied. 
But I was equally satisfied when I didn't have a penny to my name. Paul is sitting in a dungeon, chained up when he's writing this. He said, I've learned the secret. Wouldn't it be great to be satisfied and learn how to be satisfied without any of that stuff? Whether it comes or goes. He said, I've learned the secret to being content in any and every situation. And here it is. He said, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Folks, I've seen that verse put on helmets on the football players. Uh, You you know that verse. That that verse doesn't mean you can bench press 500 pounds. It doesn't mean you can make a perfect score on the ACTs. It, It doesn't mean that you can do things that you couldn't normally do. That's not what he's talking about. Look at it in context. He's talking about whether I have a bunch, it won't go to my head. And whether I have nothing, it's not going to get me down. How is it that I have this inner satisfaction regardless? I found the secret, he said. And it's so easy in the church to say Jesus is the answer. And everybody says amen. And we go out from church saying, what's that mean? Well, I want to tell you something. Jesus is the answer to contentment. But you know what John says in John fourteen fifteen, If you love me, you will obey what I command. What Paul was talking about was having a relationship with Jesus. Folk, his relationship with Jesus got him to the point where he learned the secret of contentment in any situation. So I was flipping through some channels this week on the remote. And I came to this movie that I saw when it came out at the movie theater back in 1984. It was called The Karate Kid. And the plot of this movie is that there's this young guy that wants to learn karate, number one, so he won't get beat up by a guy that doesn't like him, and number two, just so he can feel good about himself. So he goes to this karate master. The karate master, his name is Daniel, so the karate master calls him Daniel's son. You remember this? And the karate master is Mr. Miyagi. Remember that? Okay, just a little, just a little trivia there. He wants to learn karate. So he goes to the first day of karate training, I guess. And this guy has a lot of cars, a lot of old classic cars. And what's the master having do? He has him wax the cars. Wax on, wax off. Remember that? Wax on and wax off. And he wants to learn karate. So he comes back the next day. What does he have him do? Paint the fence. Down and up. Down and up. And then do it with this hand. Down and up. Down and up. And he wants to learn karate. He comes back the next day. What's he having to do? Clean the floors. You know, he's going around mopping the floors. And he keeps coming back. And he keeps having him do chores. And he's getting so frustrated. And finally he says, Mr. Miyagi, I want to learn karate. He said, after all I'm doing is your chores. Okay, he didn't even realize it. But all the techniques that he was using, waxing the car, painting the fence, and mopping the floors, was really teaching him techniques that would become second nature to him when he got in the middle of a karate match. Do you know what having a relationship with Jesus is all about? See, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands like wax on, wax off. You keep these commands. You know what's happening to you? You're shaping the person you are. You're becoming somebody different and you probably don't even know it. When you keep these commands, you're going to get to the place where you find a satisfaction that goes even beyond this life. Do you understand what this verse is really telling us? It's saying the secret is keeping the commands. When you keep the commands, it helps you be the kind of person who really wants to keep the commands. And really this last commandment urges us to go back and folk, and I'm going to wrap the whole series up right here. So here it is. This last command urges us to go back and look at all the commands. Keep putting God first. Keep setting aside time for God. Be careful how I use his name. Focus on my family. Honoring my parents. Making my marriage great. Doing all these things. They work. 
So I want to tell you two stories. And this is going back to the eighth, eighth command, don't steal, just to give you a, a little slice of this stuff, putting these commands all together, how this works. So a guy that I know, he was a preacher. Everybody in his family was a preacher. His dad was a preacher. His grandpa was a preacher. His brother was a preacher. One of his sisters married a preacher. His other sister married a preacher. Their kids are all preachers. Do you get, a, do you get what's going on here? And his sister's husband dies. And these are famous people, okay? So his sister's husband dies. And all these people say, you know, the easiest thing for us to do is write a check, almost. And all these people say, we'd like to give her some, some money. You know what my preacher friend said no? Said, he said no. He said, she's got family. We're her family. And we're going to take care of her the rest of her life. You know what she was? She was in her 50s. Her 50s. And now she's in her 60s. And guess what? They're taking care of her. I, I guess what I'm saying is the Bible, if you do it, will work. Aren't we supposed to take care of the widows and the orphans? Did you get it? The people that might not be able to get any grain, if they're a widow or an orphan, we take care of them. Okay. So let's go back. David Morris works with a mission in southern India. They've started over a thousand churches. Catch this, a thousand. Not a, not, not, you know, they haven't found a thousand additions. They have started a thousand churches in India, all across South India. That must be some big mission, we're thinking. A whole lot of people involved. Not really. It's an extremely small mission. It runs on very little funds. And you know why? But David Morse's dad was over there, too. The Morse family in India, they're so famous. You know what they do? They don't give money to the people of India. You know what? One of the things they've done from day one, they tell them, y'all want to have a church here? Then you all make a church here. And you all pay your way. They're trying to teach these people some basic principles. They're trying to teach them that they're not somebody looking for somebody else to take care of them. I'm somebody who's trying to contribute what I can. Folks, we need to teach people that. My easiest deal when somebody comes in and asks for help is just to give them money. And most of the time when I do, I haven't told them a thing. I want to tell you something. God has really blessed the church in India. I know there's more Christians now in China than there are in America. I don't know about India yet, but I'm telling you soon it will be that way. See, the more we do, the more we obey, the more we become the kind of people God wants us to be. And catch this, the more content we become and the more, yes, we can do all things through Christ who gives us his strength. Well, will we have a lot or just a little? Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for the way that you bless our lives. Thank you for the Ten Commandments. We realize there's a lot more there than what we've thought about. Father, it's easy for me to just do the easy thing instead of maybe do the teaching thing. And... Uh, 
because I know it's easier for folk that are in a bind uh, just to get the easy way out. Father, I pray that you might help us to take some time to work with people, to give them a hand up, not through our billfold all the time, but through what your word says. Father, forgive us. Please forgive us. We've all broken a lot of these ten. We've messed up so many times. I pray that we might get to the point of our life where we've practiced obedience for so long that it almost becomes second nature to us. And that uh, we become the kind of people that uh, therefore are content. Father, help us to follow Jesus. Help us to realize that means obedience. I ask this in his name. Amen. Let's stand.